Okay, so let's yeah, let's go ahead and get started, and we'll have more more time for questions, and, and people can trickle in. It looks like we have about uh, forty participants now. Okay, so uh, so welcome to the session on the announcement of opportunity for community engagement uh, with the Rubin Observatory commissioning effort. Um, so just before we get started, uh, a few reminders uh, that that by participating in this meeting, we've all agreed to. Uh, to sign the code of conduct and to treat each other with respect and to, and to raise the voices of those around us. Um, and then uh, just for some, some comments on the session format and logistics, uh, this isn't intended to be a, a pretty open discussion oriented uh, 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 session. So there'll, there'll be a, a short presentation at the beginning um, but it's mainly intended to be open for, for questions and um, in, uh, in discussion amongst us. Uh, so we have the Slack channel, which is the preferred way of, of posting questions in a written form. Um, we also will use the Zoom raise hand feature if people wanna ask, ask questions verbally. Um, and there is the Zoom chat, but, but we prefer using the Slack channel so that the questions can be um, threaded in their answers. And so there's, a, there's an archive of the responses. Um, there's a shared Google Doc. Uh, Eric Dennehy is going to be uh, taking notes on the discussion, um, but please any, anyone feel free to, um, to edit the responses um, or you know, to clarify um, if, that, if that would help. So in terms of the, the goals for the session, uh, we'll begin uh, with a brief summary of the announcement of opportunity. Um, this was posted in, in mid-July, mid um, so we're hoping that many people have had a chance to, to read it, um, but we'll do a quick overview. Um, hopefully that will be in something like 10 minutes or so, and then we'll leave most of this, uh, this session open for questions and answers. Um, so there's an anonymous question form uh, that's linked here, and you can also find the link in the Slack channel and on the, the session webpage. Um, so you can post anonymous questions there, and we'll be following that. Uh, you can also uh, look at the LSST community post for some example questions, and we'll, we'll probably draw from, from some of those if there's some quiet time, because people are brainstorming. But please feel free to start, start posting questions during, during the, the presentation. Um, you can find the link to this announcement of opportunity uh, here. So um, let's go ahead and get started uh, with an overview. So uh, this announcement of opportunity uh, is, is, the, is the Rubin Observatory inviting members of the US and Chilean LSST science communities to join the project commissioning team in order to make value added contributions uh, that facilitate an efficient transition to LSST operations. Um, to give a sense for the scale, um, the anticipated uh, FTE total uh, value added effort is, is at the level of, of 15 to 20 FTE. Uh, this is a very rough estimate, but to give a, a sense of, of scale, um, this would likely be distributed across a larger number of individuals. The contributions would be made in calendar years uh, 2022 and 2023. Um, that may be pushed uh, later, now into 2024 a little bit, um, given uh, the construction timeline. There's limited financial support that's associated with this announcement of opportunity. So in general, the non-staff members of the commissioning team are, are expected to have other sources of support. Um, there may be uh, some limited travel and local accommodation support that would be specifically to enable on-site work uh, at Rubin Observatory centers. Um, but otherwise, otherwise uh, the participants are generally expected to have other sources of support for, for salary, for example. So all of the commissioning team members, including the, the community members uh, that are participating via this announcement of opportunity, will have full unfettered access to all of the commission data products as soon as they are acquired. And another key point is that no papers presenting novel scientific results may be posted or submitted by anyone uh, before the associated data release. For commissioning data, this means the relevant uh, data preview release date. So these are some of the, the key uh, features of this announcement of opportunity. Uh, as for the purpose, uh, the, the main purpose here is to integrate expertise from the community, knowing that there are science uh, domain experts 
uh, that could significantly um, enhance the diversity of the project's planned commissioning effort. And so the announcement of opportunity, it, it provides a specific mechanism for making these contributions, um, doing so on a time scale uh, that is more rapid uh, by having immediate access to the data acquired during commissioning and done in a collaborative uh, way with, with the Rubin Observatory staff. So these individuals would become members of the commissioning team. Uh, they would be embedded uh, within the relevant uh, sub teams within the project and they will have functional points of contact on the project that would help to help to integrate them in those teams um, and to help guide those efforts and to provide support. Importantly, the project uh, will not rely on these contributions to fulfill core construction requirements and operations readiness criteria. So this is really value added uh, based on what's already scoped by the project to do. And importantly, this commissioning effort is really focused on demonstrating operational readiness uh, rather than realizing scientific discoveries with the commissioning data itself. Um, so this is, this is a, a deep uh, level of engagement and, and it comes with specific rights and responsibilities that are described in detail uh, in the announcement of opportunity. Um, I wanna make clear uh, that the data pre previews will still occur as planned and there are, there are dedicated sessions uh, at the PCW to talk about uh, early science. Um, so to be clear, uh, this announcement of opportunity is a, is a separate parallel mechanism uh, to what's happening with the data previews. Um, and there'll be other sessions to talk about this in detail, although, although we would welcome questions here as well. Uh, I don't wanna talk in too much detail about this list. Um, this is an example of value-added contributions uh, there's a little bit more description in section 3.1 of the announcement of opportunity. Um, the, the motivation of providing these examples was to help, um, help illustrate uh, the types of contributions that, that, are, uh, that are being sought, um, but we should make clear that this list is not exhaustive and there's, um, there's opportunities to propose for other ideas and iterate with the project. As far as the, um, the potential benefits, rights, and responsibilities, um, by becoming members of the commissioning team, the participating individuals would really be benefiting the entire global science community in addition to um, themselves having a, a very uh, direct experience and, and potential for deep understanding of the, of the observatory and the data products. Um, as mentioned before, this. Uh, would involve full and immediate access to all of the commissioning data products. Um, in, in order to make this all work and to collaborate, uh, we would ask that all the participating individuals are, uh, are using the, the project tools. Um, because of this deep level of engagement, uh, we would expect the individuals are, have a commitment of something like 20 to 50% uh, FTE. Um, and for university faculty, something like 20% of their, of their research time. And importantly, uh, by signing on to become a member of the commissioning team, uh, the participants would agree to follow the publication policies of the Rubin Observatory Project. Um, so this means that they are eligible to contribute to and become co-authors on the construction papers, um, but that no papers presenting these uh, novel scientific results will be posted before the associated data release. And there will be, there are ongoing discussions about how to, basically what will be the guidelines and policies for discussing the commissioning data beyond the commissioning team. Um, the process that we're talking about right now is that there will be no proprietary data products from commissioning shared outside the commissioning team, but there may be a way of sharing derived data products, for example, plots uh, based on commissioning data um, in public forums so that uh, we can engage more of the community um, during the commissioning team. So the specific guidelines on that will be um, communi by, communicated by the project at a later date. So with regards to responding to the announcement of opportunity, um, we're encouraging uh, individuals that have a particular area of expertise uh, to submit a single uh, letter of interest for their group. 
Um, we should emphasize that these groups are not associated with a particular science collaboration, although they may include members from, from a given science collaboration or from multiple science collaborations. Um, the groups can be multi-institutional um, and they can include individuals over a range of career stages. Um, in terms of the evaluation, uh, we'll look for letters of interest that are um, well aligned with the needs of the project, um, coming from individuals that have a demonstrated uh, track record of engagement with the, with the observatory um, and with the Rubin Science community. Um, and we should make clear that the Rubin Observatory is committed to providing opportunities to diverse and traditionally underrepresented groups, and that uh, contributions that would um, create training experiences for early career scientists are very much valued as part of, part of this AO. So in terms of the timeline, um, some key dates here. Uh, the first date uh, that has come up recently is the, um, is the indication of interest. Uh, these were uh, nominally due on, on last Friday. Um, we'll leave that web form open uh, this week to, to accept more responses in case there are more ideas that are triggered by discussions uh, at the PCW. Um, and then the final letter of interest submission, uh, that due date is the 1st of October. Uh, we'll take that information and review it over the next couple months um, so that we'll provide some feedback uh, by the end of the calendar year. Um, and then the commissioning, engagement with the commissioning team would begin first quarter of 2022. So in terms of the responses that have already been received so far, uh, again, this indication of interest web form uh, was optional, uh, but we were encouraging um, individuals that were considering uh, to submit the full uh, letters of interest to, to use this indication of interest uh, so that the project would have more information for planning purposes and so that the project can provide uh, meaningful feedback uh, to these groups. Um, so far, there's been 11 responses received to date. Uh, and the total number of individuals, if you just do a simple sum, uh, is about 60 to 70 individuals. Um, some of the named individuals in these groups are project staff that are interested in collaborating scientifically. Uh, we should make clear that project staff do not need to respond uh, to the AO if they're part of the construction project, um, but it's really helpful that for us to have this information for planning and for, and for context. Um, so far, the group sizes have ranged from uh, single individuals to groups of up to, to 10 in these, in these uh, indications of interest. Um, and again, we'll continue to welcome responses through that web form uh, through the end of this week. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I just wanna make clear that uh, this process is, is new to many of us, and this is the beginning of the conversation. Um, we hope that there'll be many opportunities for iteration with the, with the project. Um, as part of that, uh, Chuck and I are willing to set up office hour times um, to help answer specific questions. So if there's an interest, we could try to arrange that. Um, we'll leave this indication of interest web form um, up open through the end of this week. Um, and then a, a reminder, the letters of interest are due by the 1st of October. Um, so at this point, we'll just open it up for questions and answers. Uh, you can use the Zoom raise hand feature, post on Slack. Uh, there's the anonymous question form. Um, and then we can also look at some of the questions that have already been uh, posted on the LSST community post and the answers there. So let me pause here and we can look at look at the questions. There are no questions in the Zoom chat right now. So we got we got one question um, on the Slack channel. And the question is, I'm wondering if you are planning to enlarge the AO to members from other countries. Keith, do you want me to take that one? I would, I think that'd be great, Chuck. Okay, so um, uh, in response um, to that, uh, there was previously an equivalent announcement of opportunity to the international community, um, not directly associated with commissioning per se, but um, more on the operations side, but commissioning, um, was an open topic for that announcement and multiple international uh, institutions have indicated their interest. So I guess uh, what would be useful for Keith and I 
is if that if that announcement um, that that international announcement uh, was not broad enough or sufficient enough to uh, include uh, your particular institution, then uh, please let us know and we, we can work on that. But uh, the so that's that's part of the motivation for this AO to the Chilean and U.S. communities is that um, there was already uh, an opportunity for the international contributors um, that previously had indicated uh, support for operations. I hope that answers the question. So far, we have not received any uh, questions through the anonymous question form. There's still time. There's still lots of time. And since since we have a moment of silence, you're quiet. Um, I see a I see a raised hand. If there's someone that wants to, yeah, if someone wants to raise their hand and, and chime in. Yeah, hello. My name is Paulina Troncoso. I am here in La Serena, close to the site. Uh, I was uh, manifesting my interest because we allocate some funding for GPU computer. I don't know if you remember this expression of interest that I, well, I feel the wool from. So I would like to know uh, when or how I just send you an email to uh, get to an appointment to talk about specific details of the supercomputer or uh, we use this space I don't know how to how to do it or we just uh, make an appointment so the main thing is I am an extra galactic astronomer so what we would like to do is these 3D visualizations having the um, to the information from the imaging plus photometric redshift. So we could give the sense of 3D to the large scale structure. And for this, a, well, with the numbers of the, the images that we will need to process, we design um, the, the requirements of the supercomputer. But there might be uh, another way how we could interact or help to uh, handle the data from the LSST. So these are like the main <laughs> very big open question, especially because we still do not buy the computer. So we still have some space for changing the architecture. And we will do it, of course, looking forward to collaborate with the LSST. So I think that that's, that's um, it's probably a, a, a question that I would like to take offline. Okay. And better understand the, the plans for the computing center there in La Serena. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, the architecture of the computing center is, is should be based on what the Chilean community wants to achieve with the LSST data. And then to the extent that that um, computing resource can be applied early during the commissioning period, um, that's a conversation we should have. But um, I guess I guess my my initial response is determine what you want to have there in La Serena based on the let let it be driven mostly by or all entirely by um, what your community wants to do, and then you can then we can figure out a way to take that as a resource early and apply it um, during the commissioning period. But I would not, I would not try to change or twist um, what you want to do around the commissioning. I mean, because you're, you're going to build this computing center 
for the long term, right? Um, right. It, it's going to be a resource for um, people in La Serena and people in Chile generally uh, long term. And um, so maybe I'm, I'm thinking about this on the fly. This is a really good question and one I haven't really thought about. So I think I, I, I would like to have a deeper discussion with you on this, but maybe the um, the real question that I, I see is, is how you ramp up that facility, right, to capacity. I mean, I don't know what capacity you have funded or, or are planning on, but certainly it's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna be a ramp up, you know, so, um, you know, the ramp up during commissioning would be uh, something for us to to coordinate with. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hello. So I would just uh, send you an email to maybe discuss the details offline. Yeah, you can you can send uh, myself and Keith an email. Um, we can iterate on this. Uh, you can also, um, you know. Put put a uh, comment in the on the in our, in our Google form. Okay. Uh, we have a, we have a, a a Google form for questions. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. So um, I got another question here on the uh, Slack channel, following up on the. Um, engagement of other other participants in this AO outside the US and Chile community. Um, so the intent was with this AO was to focus on US and Chile. Um, if you have collaborators um, that have already proposed, um, you know, I would put that into any response you have, it, it, just, it just strengthens your response, I think. Um, and, um, you know, you, you just spell it out, um, you know, it's, it's like, how should that be noted in the, in the letter of interest? Just spell it out that, that this contribution is in collaboration with, name your collaborators or your, your, the institutions that you're working with, um, whether they are or are not, already um, uh, part of uh, the international contributions. Um, so that, that, that would be my response there. Let's see, there's another one here. Um, I mentioned if it would be interesting for the Christian team to have some of us in other countries to contribute to observing science for the Christian community. So, so let me, let me read that out loud. It would be useful to mention if it would be interesting for the commission team to have some of us in other countries to contribute to observing or science validation or other. So short answer to that one is yes, uh, it would be very interesting. I think um, particularly because most of the data analysis that will be done during um, the commissioning period doesn't require somebody to be on site uh, in Chile. Um, and having a distributed team over many different time zones is actually, I think, a, a very strong advantage for us. So that we're not trapped into a diurnal cycle based on a, a single location. So yes, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Keith, we actually had a, uh, a question come in on the Google Doc live, if you have that open. Uh, if not, I can read it out for you. Um, Eric, uh, yeah. please read it out. You're, you're on. <laughs> sure. Uh, the question is, there is an apparent tension between the requirement that non-Rubin members not be on the critical path and the statement that non-Rubin members take direction from project staff. Do people propose do so something that is 
parallel to the project plans and then get endorsed? And if so, how long is that taking direction? Uh, let me take a stab at that one. Um, so if you're familiar with the project and you understand our science requirements, which I think are pretty well known, you can look at those science requirements and say, and say, the, the project is going to verify and, and check off the box on those science requirements. And then you could say, you can ask yourself, for my science, uh, whatever it may be, whether it's Milky Way, structure, cosmology, transients, or whatever, I would better like to understand and characterize the data in the following ways and list those out um, because you know one of the things that we you know if, if you've seen my commissioning presentations for the last four or five years you know i always characterize that commissioning has you know three fundamental things that we have to do we have to verify that we built the thing that we built we have to validate that the, the, the thing we built does what we want it to do. And then we have to characterize how the system performs so that we understand how the data are produced and, and the properties of data. It's that last point that, that it's such an open-ended thing that that's where I think the community really can step in and help us out a lot is to do that characterization to you know, the, the construction project's going to check off boxes and say, yep, we met this requirement, met that requirement. Um, it operationally does performs or, or we can operationally uh, make it do the things that we want it to do. But it's that characterization element. That's where I think the community really can come into play and say, hey, you know what? Um, you know, you guys, there's this little feature in the data that I, I've associated with this little bit of telemetry or whatever, some property of the, the technical bits and pieces and say, um, you know, there's a correlation here. And I see Robert's got his, he's got his screen on and he's got his hand up and he wants to contribute to uh, my answer in the conversation. So Robert, I see the floor. Yeah, okay, thank you. I mean, in theory, that's all great. The trouble is that in practice, generally, somebody comes in and they say, there's something funny here. And they don't say, and the problem is this line in this piece of code. And they don't say the problem is this encoder. They say, there's something funny. And then somebody has to do the work of chasing down whether it's interesting or not, whether it's something about the analysis, whether it's something about the software and the project. So I don't think we're going to be able to draw such a clear line in the in the sand between somebody coming in to characterize and things. Um, I think it's going to be right. deeply, um, um, a lot of work for people on project. And that's why there are these words about working for the project in the sense of taking direction so that we can make that process of sorting out if you found a real effect, whether it's interesting and how to characterize it as efficient as possible. And just coming in from the outside and saying, there's something weird isn't usually very efficient for busy people. So let me let me just add on to I think what Robert said is that that's what we mean by taking direction from the project, right? Is that um, you know if 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 you, if someone in their characterization effort identifies something weird as Robert describes it, then we may then. And, and if we say, oh, that's really important for us to figure out um, before we sign off on this thing, we may say, okay, we want you to dig in deeper and, and try to figure out what the correlation is uh, between that weird thing and the way the system is being operated or, or performed. I think that's, is that okay, Robert? With 
I think it's usually more intertwined than something as simple as that, which is what yeah. really scares well, me about this. But, I, but, I, but I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do right now is help guide people on how they can re best respond to the announcement of opportunity. So, um, you know, I would say, you know, rather than kept coming up with a concrete proposal of I'm going to do X study or Y study, better to say, I have this team of people with the following skills and we can, we can contribute in the following areas. So the reason I kept pushing on you is because they should expect, I think, to get very intertwined with things they don't think they care about as part of what start, started sound that came in sounded like a reasonably straightforward scientific investigation. Um, so, because that's what it takes to commission a system like this. I mean, maybe the problem is in some bearing somewhere and, or maybe it's a problem in the software, or maybe it's a problem in the, um, the assumptions made in the scientific analysis. So I think people coming in should expect to get their hands extremely dirty with things that they don't think they're interested in. Um, Paul's looking suspicious, but that's all right. So Robert, I was thinking, uh, I happen to think, and you know that you're going about the de-blending completely in the wrong way. Of course you do, yes. And, uh, I think I can do a much better job uh, and demonstrate it to you. And the sooner you give me a chance to do it, the better. So you're the project, you go ahead and you do it your way, but I would like the opportunity to show you how much better one could do, how low you set your standards. Yep. How do I go about doing that? Well, first of all, you accept a job offer from me because I'm really scared about the deblender. Um, the easiest way for us would be to implement your brilliant algorithm, which exploits the fact that all galaxies are identical um, in, a, in a way that can be plugged into what we're doing already, which means using data structures that you're not familiar with. Um, you won't be able to write it in Perl anymore, Paul. You're gonna have to learn Python, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, because then we can just switch out one algorithm and we can make the same plots and indeed, your red sequence is going to be 0.01 mags wide and ours is going to be 0.1 mags wide, everybody's going to be happy. But failing that then, and that's the most useful thing for us. Obviously the other limit is that we take some shared data and you say, I plotted this up from your stuff and I plotted the same objects up um, and I've got something that looks a lot better. But still, if you've done your own test as well, because you don't have to pay from my other for what I say here, then we're not comparing apples with oranges. So maybe what I would say is just, you have to start at this point in what we've done. Don't redo the ISR, although you think our bias corrections are crazy. Don't redo our PSF estimation. And yes, you do have to handle all five bands at once because that was part of the reason that drove our design. And then do it yourself. So I don't have a good answer, but I, I don't think you're just going to be able to come in and give us some X minus Y, X minus, gets against Y plots and say, you're idiots. Because though that's true, it's not actionable. So, so Robert, let me, let me um, uh, address Paul's question in a more pragmatic way and give some advice on, on how he could proceed is in response to this AO, um, just put in a response that says, I want to, I'm going to benchmark your galaxy deblending algorithm. And then with your own algorithm or whatever algorithms you want to benchmark it against, but then that would open up uh, the pathway for you to have access to the data and uh, work with us on, on that particular aspect. Does, I think that's a very pragmatic way to, uh, to, to address this. But all the problem is work with us is the complicated thing. Yeah, well, it, it's all gonna be complicated, but I, but I think that's the way to go about it and say, okay, I, you know, say, I propose to benchmark the Rubin Observatory Galaxy D blending algorithm against what? Well,
Thank you, Chuck. That was very helpful. It was the word benchmark that uh, opened the door. Yep. I mean, a lot of this stuff is um, a lot of these things that we're asking the community to, to do is is you know cross checking what we're producing, and that's 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 the benchmark. Watch out, Robert. My experience <laughs> is usually somebody coming in with a benchmark isn't something that's helpful. It tells us we have to make changes. It doesn't tell us anything about what to do. Now, a benchmark that leads to something we can run on in production to say, we're still doing less well than Paul is useful. So that, but that's more work for Paul than doing a one-off benchmark. So, I, I mean, I do think we want to, I think Chuck, you need to emphasize just how much uninteresting work people are signing up for if they're going to be able to contribute very much. I mean, That's why we're asking people to write it up and, and respond and, and we can figure this out. Um, but yeah. It's also but I think, you know, the did. data previews will still exist. So outside of the commissioning process, people who want to look at data will have an opportunity to do that with the early data that's been packaged in sort of a, <clears throat> in a way that looks right. more like what it's going to look like coming out of operations. So, so for yeah, some people, that'll be a more natural place for them to work. And for other people who really want to be involved in working on the guts of it, it might be in commissioning. So you can think about where you best fit in. Yeah. It, it, and I, I think that's a good point, Chris, is that, um, between uh, this announcement of opportunity and the access to the commissioning data on very short time scales versus the data previews, I think that's the key element, right? Is the time scale of engaging with the data. And uh, at, at which point do, you, do we see the feedback from that engagement uh, coming in? I mean, to me personally, the, the quick interaction with with um, the commissioning data is more about, are we technically doing something fundamentally wrong and are we making mistakes? And then with the data previews, that has a longer time scale, longer tail um, about how the results from interacting with the data previews would influence future um, science pipeline algorithms and data processes. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see. I, I'm looking at the uh, Slack channel right now. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, some of this is, uh, I think, a little bit nuanced. Um, so just a clarification, the reason, the reason why this announcement of opportunity was directed specifically at US and Chilean communities was because that there was already the international uh, announcement that involved commissioning, even though I understand that, that um, it may not have, have been as widely broadcasted as as uh, or generically broadcast events, this current AO. Um, if again, if you have if you have international collaborators and you want to respond to the AO, put them into the AO as as um, a resource and or an asset that you have available to you. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so regarding how the the, um, the the commissioning team will operate, um, I mean, we we do need, you know, if we do discover, as Robert was saying, um, anomalies, which we undoubtedly will, um, and 
you know, they may not validate a, or, or invalidate a requirement, but it's an anomaly nonetheless. I think we do want to be able to direct work to the team, the broader team, to say, hey, there's this anomaly. Um, can you can you try to get to the bottom of it? So, so Chuck, you know, you, do you, are you talking about data anomalies or software anomalies? Paul doesn't trust my ability to handle perfectly good data, which is a legitimate thing to worry about. In some sense, in commissioning, we're more worried about discovering that the telescope doesn't work. So the data we're taking is worthless. And which are you referring to? They're both anomalies in the data, at least in the final outputs. Well, it, if, if the telescope isn't working correctly, it's going to show up in the data. <laughs> oh. Yes, but it can be very subtle, right? And well, that's subtle, subtle things may or may not be in the data. They may be in the software or the analysis. And that's when it gets hard when somebody comes well, in and says, I and, found and, something. And that's, that's where the directed work comes in is, is to try to disentangle that ambiguity. So if we see an anomaly in the data, is it, is it a hardware problem or is it a software problem? That's fundamental. So I, I, the, 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 the comment was, you know, is it directed work or is, are we providing the community with guidance on the things that they should be paying attention to? And I think it's a bit of both. But you know, certainly in the in the in the heat of commissioning, we are going to discover things that are going to need serious attention, and we need to be able to assign those things to uh, teams of people um, that are not necessarily the core project people, because the core project people are still trying to get the hardware and the, the other systems to work nicely with each other. So I think Robert, to your point. You know, the, the signature that we're going to be keying off of for most of this stuff is the signature out of the data. I mean, we, we, have, we have technical experts on the construction team that will know whether or not the telescope is slewing properly, tracking properly, the, the active optics is, is converging properly, et cetera. But then how all of that stuff imprints itself onto the data, that's where I think our community um, uh, expertise comes into play. Paul, you have your hand up? You had to have a yes. comment? Or? Yeah, let me, let me put this in extreme form. So is it more uh, Robert comes up with the problems and I solve them, or I come up with the problems and he solves them? Um, I cause the problems and you solve them, Paul. Oh, okay. Just wanted to get that straight. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good question, Paul, because I think it's it's a mix of both, right? Um, fifty-one forty-nine or forty-nine fifty-one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Your crystal ball may be better than mine. I use a magic eight ball. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think the problem, but, Paul, is that we don't know where the problems are coming from. They could be my problems. They could be Chuck's problems, or they could be your problems. Or more but, likely, there are nonlinear interaction between all three of those. But I guess, I guess, to answer Paul is what I would hope we could get out of this effort is a recommendation. If you if you find a problem, you know, first of all, check. It's good to identify the problem. Second, it would be even better if there was a recommendation for how to solve the problem. I don't know if that helps Paul or not. <laughs> uh, it's good. I think that the main message here also is that we acknowledge that we cannot do this in a vacuum and we do want input from our experts out in the community. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, there's more typing going on. Let's see. Uh, any other questions? I don't see anything on the um, 
Zoom chat or uh, I'm not monitoring the Google spreadsheet. I am monitoring the Slack channels or any other questions from the, the assembled. Nothing yet, Chuck, from the Google spreadsheet or the anonymous anonymous question source either. All right, thanks, Eric. Okay, uh, let's see. We still have a few minutes left, I think. Keith, do you want to say anything? Let's see. We we are. I see a I see a, a hand raised. D Mills is the is the Zoom name. Dave. Hi there. I think uh, maybe uh, um, a way to think about Paul's question is, say he finds something in the data, uh, we will want to direct him maybe by saying, okay, can you please take this data set and run your analysis on that and tell us what that says? So he's sort of being directed in that fashion to investigate the problem from our perspective. So after identifying the problem from my perspective, I should re-identify it from your perspective. Well, you should you should be willing to run data sets that we give you through your algorithms. Oh, I've well, run everything. So so Paul, actually what I what what I what I interpreted Dave to be saying is that after you if you discover a problem, you could say, why don't you take this data set to further either characterize it or confirm what you think the issue is. That would be useful. That would, that would be a useful short-term feedback for us mm -hmm. while we're on sky and doing commission observations. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right, Dave? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one example that could be many, but it's just a question of that it will be some kind of iterative process. It won't just be reporting something and then that's it. Sure. Yeah, I don't think anybody's under the illusion that um, when we get to on sky observing that it's going to be a rote recipe and we're just going to crank through it without active iteration and adjustments along the way. I think we, we all recognize that. But that's that that is, I think, in my mind, that that is one of the value added things um, for this announcement of opportunity for that rapid feedback is to say, hey, why don't you take, you know, spend two hours taking this this data set um, mm -hmm. in this way? Um, and and let's figure let's figure out what the uh, the issue is. So the suggestion for diagnostics might come from the non-members. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. All right, Keith, I think we are we are at we are past the top of the hour. Um, this session goes till 5.15, Chuck, so you have a couple minutes if you still want questions. Oh. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm misreading the uh, sheet. So we still, have, we still have 10 minutes then. If we wanted to use that up with more questions or, or feedback. Hey, Chuck, uh, Rand Powell asked a question in the chat, I think about the deadline for the letters of interest and if you would just confirm when it is. Uh, in the chat. You could just say, when, when, are, when are you expecting the letters of interest to come in? October 1. Great. With regard to the indications of interest web form, we were encouraging people to submit those by this past Friday so that we would have, you know, some, some, some sense of the community level of interest uh, by this week. 
uh, but we realized that discussions at the PCW might, you know, might trigger more ideas, more interest. And so we're going to leave that web form open until Friday this week in case there are um, additional ideas submitted. Again, that's that's mainly for this iterative process and the and the full letters of interest are, are 1 October. So the other thing I, I, I uh, want to reemphasize, I think Keith mentioned it in his opening comments, is that um, if you, if anybody on this uh, session wants to have a more private or detailed conversation with either Keith and I, please, please reach out. Uh, if it would help you in constructing a, a response to the AO. Otherwise, I'm not seeing any additional questions showing up. Keith, I don't know if you have any closing remarks you want to make. Maybe just um, one other question that I've heard sort of trickling through in recent days is if there are uh, university-based groups, for example, and there's a mix of say more senior scientists, including faculty, as well as students and postdocs. And perhaps the students and postdocs are doing more of the, it's, it's intended that more of the students and postdocs are doing uh, the day-to-day -day work and the faculty are providing more of a super supervision role. Um, just if you could speak a little bit to um, how, how groups should, should discuss this in the, in the letters of interest the sort of relationship between the senior and junior scientists and advisee and who's who's doing the work. I'm sorry, Keith, was that directed to me? Yes. <laughs> well, I think the way the way to think about it is um, like with almost any any other proposal, right, is that the the, the senior faculty person in, in the case that Keith outlined is in many ways considered a the PI of, the, of that group's efforts, and so um, you know there will be a, a collaborative interaction with the students or postdocs, but you know on an administrative level, um, you know the project will be interacting with the PI, and um, you know the 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 objective here is not to overload the construction project commissioning team with having to interact with you know 70 or more people but to funnel work through um, a given individual that's identified as effectively the pi for a group um, you know when it comes to individuals that are proposing or or asking to contribute and we'll, we'll take that um, one step at a time. I see Ed is on. Hi, Ed. Ed, I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I am. Uh, do you want to say anything about um, NSF's position on providing uh, any kind of support for this kind of contribution. I know this has been a topic of conversation um, and I don't know where the NSF stands on this. Uh, sure, Chuck, I'm happy to do it. Uh, you know, this may be on various people's minds on uh, how NSF can support this. And, you know, I, we don't have any special mechanisms, right? Um, that don't already exist, which is mainly our, our main grants uh, program, the Astronomy Astrophysics Research Grants Program. So, I, I mean, I put that out there. It really depends on what you're going to do. For anything that you would do, it's the same kind of things you need to do uh, to get support, which is to make 
make a strong case for the reviewers and uh, for, you know because they're going to in your proposal of course and uh, so I would give you the same advice I normally would which would be that you know why this project right so if you want to support something and you're doing something beyond what the project is doing you know why this project why this PI and team, however it applies, and why now? Because that's going to all be important to a reviewer to consider. Uh, so those are the, the normal three questions you really have to answer clearly in any proposal. And you're going to be competing with others. Uh, that's always the case. You have to make a strong science case because we always get tons of proposals that are most of which are worthy of funding, but we only can fund uh, the, the money, we, uh, you know, the, uh, what we have support to give so and that's tight you know 20 ish percent right and i don't expect that to change in any dramatic fashion so i, I mean I, I say that generically uh, i will say that uh, at least this year i know of at least one award that's been recommended it has a, a um, for for ruben lsst support uh to researchers through that pro through the program i can't say it'll it'll be public by the end of the fiscal year anyway uh, I'm pretty sure the PI would would be informed of this by now, but I'm just letting you know that our regular program already can support and does support research for this project ahead of data coming out. So it, you know it can be done, and it will and it will be done more and more as we get closer to having data, and it'll be easier to make the case. I'm sure. So I'm saying that this is a special situation with the commissioning, right? Because it might not be so easy to get support unless you really can make a strong science case. But the one thing that we can do, and we will do, and we're already in the process of doing, is you know part of my job is to educate all the pro other program officers so that they understand like that this program is, exists for one thing. Uh, so they all know that already. And uh, that we all have to educate the reviewers, right? We're going to really weigh in and compare what you're proposing against others. And so that's a, so there's three pieces, three ways the, the reviewers will learn, right? First and most important and prominent is in the proposal. Don't assume that, uh, in fact, you can assume the opposite. Don't assume the reviewer is going to know exactly what the project is funded to do and what they're not funded to do. And it has to be clear to them because they're going to come as your skeptical peers and assume that um, the project's already funded to do this, right? Otherwise, well, you know, it can't be important. So, so you're going to have to overcome that in the proposal and how much space you need to devote to that. Well, certainly a sentence won't do. You're going to probably need, uh, you know, a page. I, I mean, who knows how much, but you need to devote enough so that you make a very clear case on what the project is doing and what your proposing to do to get funding for that goes beyond that and that it's not funded by the project to do uh, besides having the strong science case and make that clear so that's that's the first way that the reviewers will learn and very the most important way the second is that the project and i'm working with the project so that they can make clear uh, so you have a reference besides what you're already writing in your proposal referencing what uh you know uh, to the project a, a website or something so it's clear that what you're saying is true, that the project only does this and doesn't do, you know, does X and does not do Y. And uh, so that it's clear what you're proposing is actually true. And they have a, so that's an external way. So that's another way that the reviewers will learn what's funded and what isn't. And, um, and the third way is uh, for the program officers when they're instructing um, reviewers, uh, either in the panel or, you know, before or during and, um, that indeed it's all true that what they're proposing here what you, you would be proposing is not funded by the, the project and so if you're looking for additional support to do this kind of work you have to make the case and make it clear that again what's supported what isn't supported and finally i think in most maybe i don't know if it's most importantly but if there's only two of you who do this you know two pis who propose you know, and we multiply that by 0.2, right? That's not, um, you know, it's not likely that you'll get funded, right? Just generically. But if there's a dozen people or a dozen PIs out there who put proposals in or 20 or whatever, that could be a panel's worth, in which case we can almost guarantee that some will get funded. So uh, I, I, I mentioned this to you because it's important. You're functioning as a community. Proposal pressure will determine, uh, does drive a lot of how things get funded. So, so if there's going to be a dozen of UPIs or 20 PIs who uh, 
participate in this program or you know, anything in that kind of neighborhood, you, I can almost guarantee we'll have a panel and that at least a few will get funded. So um, it, it's a, the usual the usual things apply for getting funded uh, as they always do. But uh, we'll, well, what I can guarantee is the program officers will be aware of this and will be helping to educate the, the reviewers on the situation and um, you know, uh, we'll do the best we can to make sure you can get there's funding out there for this activity. Thank you, Ed. I, that, that's really uh, uh, encouraging information. And um, I think the, the, the concept of uh, if, if enough proposals come in that there would, could be a dedicated panel, um, that should be, I hope that, that that provides some level of motivation <laughs> to our community to uh, put some pressure on you guys there in Washington. <laughs> so, okay. Um, and I, I really appreciate those comments, Ed. Thank you. Um, we are now at, at, at quarter past. Um, do we have any final words of wisdom that uh, uh, Keith or anybody else wants to uh, chime in on to wrap this up? I'll just mention quickly that the last slide of the presentation um, includes links to several project documents that describe the formal requirements and the construction completeness criteria. So in order, in order to help understand the scope of what the construction project is already planning to do with respect to science verification, those documents may be helpful. Yep. Excellent. All right, I think we're at the end of our session now. Um, Keith, thank you very much for taking the charge here and, and, and leading the conversation and getting us started. I think we can wrap this up for the day and we'll start up again uh, with day two of the uh, PCW. Um, uh, we kick off tomorrow morning with Bob doing an operations update. And we have research bites and then a host of parallel sessions. So uh, look forward to seeing um, all of you on Zoom in the, over the next few days. And lightning stories before Bob, 15 minutes. Oh, early. sorry. My bad, Grand Pal. Lightning stories. Absolutely. And some of our young, energetic uh, project people get to tell their story. So encourage you guys to attend that because you'll 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 learn a little bit about some of the people that you may not know a lot about in the first place. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you all. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, Keith and I will be working to pull this stuff together for you. Um, please um, give it some hard thought on responding and uh, take Ed's words to heart. If you don't ask, you won't get. <laughs> so ask. Um, and we'll, uh, Keith and I will try to keep you as informed as we possibly can through our various channels. So thank you. <laughs>